message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there is a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for another interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join them now. We're certainly glad you're with us today, and we trust that our time together in God's Word will be a blessing to you. As we look in Ephesians chapter number 3, at what I personally believe is the most important prayer in all of the Bible. Uh, you know, if you would ask someone, well, what, what, are, the, what are the most important prayers uh, in Scripture? Somebody's going to say, well, the, the so-called Lord's Prayer, uh, our, the Our Father Prayer. Uh, that's the official prayer of religion today, uh, at least Christendom today. And, uh, and yet there, there are, there's a lot of strange things about praying the uh, so-called Lord's Prayer. I don't know if you've ever looked it up in the Scripture, but in Matthew chapter number 6, uh, where that uh, uh, prayer is recorded, the, the, the two verses just before it tell you not to repeat it. Uh, Christ says, don't pray like the heathen. That is, you just learn and memorize and, 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 and just vainly repeat the same words over and over and over. Prayer in the Bible is not just the recitation of memorized uh, verses to God. Prayer is just simply talking to God. And if your prayer life consists of just repeating, uh, I was raised in a church where uh, every Sunday morning the, the pastor had what was called a pastoral prayer. And, uh, and he prayed, and when he got through, he, he, pray, he would say, and now we pray as our Savior taught us to pray, our Father which art in heaven, and the whole congregation would repeat, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, so on and so forth. Um, I was one time at a, at a PTA meeting for my children in school, and we were sitting there discussing uh, school business in the parent-teacher's uh, meeting, and a fire truck went down the street in front of the, the school building there and uh, stopped, and you could hear it stopped about two blocks away. And the lady that was conducting the meeting, she said, uh, well, it's obviously at one of our houses, so maybe, Mr. So-and-so, you'd go see whose house it is, and the rest of us will wait. And he got up and left, and she says, maybe we should all pray. And I thought, well, that's an interesting thing. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Let's pray. And she bowed her head, and she started saying, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be, and everybody started repeating with her. And I, and I sat there and thought, what does our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, have to do with somebody's house burning down? <laughs> you know, well, it doesn't have anything to do with it. But what that is is just the knee-jerk reaction of, well, I'll pray, so I'll repeat a prayer. Or maybe you've learned the prayer of St. Francis of Sissies or somebody like that, you know, or you take some prayer out of the Old Testament or whatever. That isn't praying. Let me just clue you in. That's not praying at all. God doesn't want your worship as, as just a mindless, uh, knee-jerk reaction to, his, uh, to things. What God wants is your worship as an intelligent response, a response of heartfelt faith to an intelligent understanding of His Word. He doesn't want you just... I mean, if, if, if that's the way you communicated with people all day long and uh, you just said, you know, repeated words back to them, so I'm going to get my card out and read it to you, you'd get sick of communicating with them. That's like, that's to consider God not to be a person. Uh, God is a person. And prayer is, is a divine operating asset that is given to the believer to work in, in, in consort with the Word of God, whereby you and I can be empowered by the Spirit of God, whereby God the Holy Spirit can energize and empower our lives and cause the doctrine and the, uh, the, the understanding of who we are in Christ to live in us for God's glory. It's a great asset. And the Holy Spirit empowers the lives of believers. One, through the Word of God. He empowers us from within. Ephesians 3 verse 16 says, He strengthens us with might by His Spirit in the inner man. And this prayer in Ephesians 3, in, in my mind, as I think about the prayers of the Word of God that are important and necessary to understand, I think this is probably the most important prayer in all of Scripture. And I know it's important for you and me to understand. So as we've been studying the issue of prayer the last few weeks, I want to be sure that we go over this passage also. Let me read you, start reading. Verse 14, uh, Paul says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, to that 
Now here are what he is praying for. Here are his um, prayer requests. That he, God the Father, would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Now that's an unmeasurable store. The measure that Paul is requesting to be, to be drawn by is the riches of his glory, that he would, you would be strengthened with might according to his spirit in the inner man. Paul says, first of all, I'm praying that God the Holy Spirit would, would strengthen you with might by his spirit in the inner man. Paul said, I want you to have the strength and the capacity and the fortitude to cope with the details of life as you live them. And that's going to happen as the Spirit of God strengthens you with might, with mighty working power, where? In the inner man. Now that's important. Not in the outer man, but in the inner man. Not in the, in the outward, physical, fleshly circumstances and life, not by keeping a car from running over you or, you know, that kind. But in the inner man, an internal, though our outward man perish, he says, the inward man is renewed day by day. Now the Holy Spirit empowers the believer in two ways. First of all, he empowers you, well, he, he, he empowers you by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit empowers the believer through the Word of God. If, and I, I'm not an artist to draw, to draw somebody, but if, if I were to draw you, or me, maybe I should draw, looks sort of like Ross with the big ears. But uh, if I was to draw us, you know, and, and uh, here we are, and uh, a person, and, and you're going you're, you're gonna, to gonna be here, and uh, you hear the Word of God, you hear the Scripture, you hear what God says, and, and, and God, God the Holy Spirit works through His Word. So the, the Word of God, you take in the Word of God. Uh, in, into your, your mind, uh, into your spirit. The Spirit of God, the Word of God comes in. You have, a, you have a will. And that will is a function of what the Bible calls your heart. Now your heart is the mentality of your soul. And your heart has, has some, so, some, some things that are involved in it. Your soul, uh, your inner man. And that will takes that doctrine takes that Word of God that your mind hears and perceives. It is your will that reaches up and takes that, and with the heart man believes. Your will takes that information, that Word of God that comes in, and transfers it down here into your soul. Transfers it down in here into the file and in the, and in the, the storage system of, of your soul. Now, the, your conscience, you have a conscience. And your conscience is a function of your, of your heart. And what your conscience does is your conscience takes your, your activity, uh, your, your current performance, what you're thinking and what you're doing, and your conscience evaluates your current behavior based on the information that's stored up in, this, in, this, uh, in your soul down here. Now the way God the Holy Spirit empowers a believer is through the Word of God. God the Holy Spirit resides in the, in, 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 in the believer. You have a new nature. God the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God that is stored up in your soul. Now if you only have a little bit of the Word of God stored up in your soul, what you are doing is restricting and uh, uh, confining the ministry and the capacity of the Holy Spirit uh, to affect the different areas of your life. But the more of the Word of God that you have stored up in your conscience, that is... You have a, and Paul talks about having, I believe, having a defiled conscience. Uh, that is, you've got a bunch of garbage in here. Garbage in, garbage out, okay? But as you take out the old garbage, the old human viewpoint, the old religious system, and the old worldly views, the old satanic thinking systems, and you replace it with, with the Word of God, your conscience then is what Paul calls fortified. It, it is made strong. And now God the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and takes that Word and then works out through that Word. As you by faith, you look out here and you see a, a stimulus in life and you see that stimulus. You have to deal with whatever this thing out here is. 
God, the, as, as, as you, you, you view it, you see it, God the Holy Spirit now takes your conscience. What am I going to do with that? You have a system of norms and standards that evaluates proper thinking and proper behavior. And you look at the situation, you evaluate it. You evaluate it on the basis of the doctrine, the understanding, the thinking process that is down here in your soul. And then you come to, the, you come to a faith choice to operate on the basis of what the Word of God says. Not on the basis of, of, of your emotions. Not on the basis of, 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 of your intellect. Not on the basis of your human viewpoint thinking. But rather on the basis of... The, the, the sound doctrine that is, that is stored up in your soul down here. And you may, with the heart, man believes. You make a choice in the inner man to believe the doctrine and walk on the basis of that. We're going to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. That is not done in a willy-nilly kind of fashion. That's not something you go over in a prayer closet and pray, Oh, God, give me grace. Give me strength. Just pour it on. God doesn't just bore a hole inside your head and pour that stuff in. He doesn't take you and plug you into a socket somewhere and it just goes, Woo! The power, the supernatural empowerment of God the Holy Spirit works indirectly through the, in the believer through the Word of God resident in the heart of the believer. When you by faith access it, we have... Paul says in Romans 5, 2, that, it's by, that, that it is by faith that we have access into this grace wherein we stand. And faith, my friend, faith is not presumption. Faith is simply believing what God says. Faith is saying what God says is real, what God says is true, that isn't real, that isn't true, that's only temporary, that isn't eternal. That isn't the thing that's the real issue. You know, folks, you know that what you see and what you hear and what you think can often be wrong. You're often wrong. You often look at something and don't see it all. That's how the, the, the sleight of hand. You've watched the magician uh, uh, David Copperfield as he made the uh, uh, Statue of Liberty disappear or as he would fly in and fly off with a star with an audience member in his, in his magic. That's all magic. Nothing supernatural about that. You know that if you knew the trick to it, you could see it. We've all seen trickery, magic things, sleight of hand. You can't always trust what you can see. We've all been deceived by what we heard. We've been lied to and not a, we've all been deceived on what things that we knew where we didn't know. You're not, you're not going to be able to figure it all out. But what, why not trust? Because, because you can't always trust what you see, what you feel, and what you think. You can trust God. He never makes a mistake. He never says anything that's wrong. There isn't anything He doesn't know the up and down about, in and out, round about. He knows the skinny on everything. So you might as well trust. Why not trust Him? I'll trust His doctrine. Paul says, I'm praying for you. First of all, that you'd be strengthened by His Spirit in the inner man. The doctrine inside of you. Now, the strengthening comes two ways. First, it comes, the Holy Spirit works through His Word. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. The Word working in you that believe. So that's how the Holy Spirit's going to strengthen you in the inner man. First through the Word, and then by prayer. Because it is as you pray, as you, as you prayerfully think over the doctrine. You look at the circumstances, here's the context of life you've got to live in. These are the circumstances you are facing and living in. And as you prayerfully meditate on the Word of God and how to take God's Word and properly apply it to those circumstances, that's what prayer is. Talking to God about the circumstances and about His Word, what His Word has to say and how to take His truth and apply it to the details of life. As you do that, that energizes God's Word. You have access by faith into this grace, this identity that we have in Christ, wherein we stand. And Paul says in the passage here, first thing he's praying, that God would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. Now, my friend, that power 
whereby that Word of God works in you is the power of Almighty God's glory. There's nothing. There's no circumstance in life that you can't cope with because God has made you more than adequate. He says we're more than conquerors through Him that loved us. In Christ, every victory is already mine. Now, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the problems, no matter what the difficulty, no matter what they might do with the outward man, though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And you see, it's through this thinking process whereby I look at the circumstances and that causes me to prayerfully meditate on God's Word and think through how that Word can best be applied to the details of my life. As I do that, I'm releasing and energizing, that, the, I'm releasing the, the power of the Spirit of God to work in me and through me. And what happens then is that that power of God begins to operate in my life. That's called the renewing of your mind. Paul said, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. By constantly adjusting your thinking patterns to the way God is thinking. Then he goes on in verse 17, the next thing. Uh, not only that you'd be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. You see, for Christ to dwell in you, not just to be in you, but to dwell, to settle down and feel at home, it's going to be by faith. As you walk by faith in the truth of His Word, then you're going to have to have that Word stored up in your heart to have something to have faith in. That you being, being rooted and grounded in love, when you understand who you are in Christ, you see, when, when you get a hold of what God has accomplished for you through the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, you begin to understand how much God Almighty values and esteems you. You get to be rooted and grounded in His love for you in Christ. You being rooted and grounded in love, how does that come about? That comes as you store up that doctrine in your soul. You get rooted, firmly fixed where you can't be moved and grounded. You're settled. There's stability. You're established in the faith as you've been taught. The Spirit of God is empowering the doctrine and the, 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 the doctrine about the love and the grace of God to you in Christ. That's the doctrine being, being put up here. That's what grace is all about. This would be the doctrine of grace. Grace has to do with the love of God for you in Christ Jesus, all that God is free to do for you through the finished work of Christ. This new identity that God has given you in His Son begins to store up in your heart and you begin to understand who you are. And now you live your life. You look at the circumstances out here and in those circumstances you don't go out and live just like who, who you used to be. You don't define yourself by your failures or by your limitations. You now, you now understand that in this circumstance you live as who you are, as a child of God. As someone who's blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, who's complete in Christ, and who's made more than a conqueror in Him that loved you. One who's completely and totally accepted in Christ. One who's forgiven and made a new creature, made His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works. You find out what they are and you go out here and in those circumstances of life can do what God created you to do. That you're being rooted and grounded in that understanding of His love. May be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. I hope you can see why it is that Paul wants the believer to be empowered by God the Holy Spirit. You see, the reason that he wants you to be, to be, to have the Spirit of God's power working in you through His Word, the reason he wants you to have Christ dwelling in your heart, settle down and feeling at home and living comfortably in your life, Jesus Christ gave His life for you at Calvary so that when you trust Him, He could give His life to you. So that day by day, as you walk by faith in Him and in the identity He gives you, He can live His life through you. I'm crucified with Christ. 
Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That's who I am. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. The life that I live out through my flesh is His life, His actions, His attitudes. The reason He wants you to have that empowerment I mean, why does he want, why, why does he want you, what are you to be empowered to do? You notice in the passage, big things, God has empowered you so you can go out and move mountains, change power structures and political systems and, is that what it is? Did he empower you to do big things for God? Let's be big or go home. <laughs> is that what he empowered you to do? Well, it says, verse 18, that you may be able to comprehend with all saints. You know what comprehending is? It has to do with using your mind. Comprehending means to be able to lay hold of something with your mind. And when he says that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height? When he talks about the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, he doesn't tell you the breadth and the depth and the length and the height of what? Now, a lot of people read the verse and they say, well, it's the breadth, the length, and the depth and height of the love of Christ. But that isn't what it says. He says that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. The idea is if you comprehend the breadth and the length and the depth and height of something, it's going to give you the capacity to really appreciate what it is God's doing and how much God really values and esteems you. Well, tell me, what is the subject of the book of Ephesians? I mean, you know, if you, if you say something, for example, if you say, shut the door, the subject of that sentence is not there. The subject is you. We say in grammar that it's, you, it's an understood subject. When he didn't put the subject in there, that you might not comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and height, he expected you to know what the subject was. What's the subject that he's talking about in the book of Ephesians that he's now praying that you could comprehend? Well, look back down through the first four, five, six, seven, eight, nine verses of Ephesians 3, and it'll tell you he's talking about the mystery program. He's talking about this great program that God has, has revealed through the Apostle Paul to us called the mystery. And it has to do with forming the church, the body of Christ, out of a bunch of lost, hell-bound, and hell-deserving sinners, Jews and Gentiles, bond and free, placed together on an absolute equal basis through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Placed together in a spiritual unit of believers called the church, the body of Christ. And he said, I want you to understand the breadth of that. It starts before the foundation of the world when God planned to do it, chapter 1, verse 4. It extends out into the eternity future out there in the, in the ages to come, uh, chapter 2, verse 7. Hence, it's called His eternal purpose. How broad is it? Eternity past to eternity future. That's how broad it is. The, the breadth, the length. That's how long it's going to last, folks. It's an eternal thing. The depths. You know how deep it is? Chapter 2 says he reached down and took, took people who were by nature the children of wrath. That's how deep it went. Right down to the place where he grabbed a hold of you and me who are dead in sins and trespasses. Walking according to the course of this world. Not seeking after God, not loving God, not wanting Him. But he reached down to the miry clay in the depths of sin and saved you. And the heights, what are the heights? That's the heights that's making us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. He's going to actually take you and me and exalt Himself through us, out through the heavenly places themselves. When you begin to grasp the grandeur, the length and the breadth, how wide it is, no one is ex accepted. The depths of how low He reached to get you and the heights of how high He's exalted us. Then you be able, then you begin to appreciate how much God values and esteems you. Then you'll never let someone come along and say, well, if God really loved you, he wouldn't let that circumstance come along in your life. Then you can comprehend and get a hold of the value and esteem that he has for you. And then you can be filled with all the fullness of God. Would you like for God to control your life today? 
Would you like to be filled with all the fullness of the divine Godhead? That word being filled with it, it just means to be saturated with it to the place that it controls and dominates your life. To be controlled with the fullness of God, folks, is simply another way of saying just to be controlled by the love of Christ for you. You see, the control of Christ comes in your life from an understanding of His love to you. As you begin to understand the love and grace of God to you, all that God has provided for you through the cross work of Calvary begins to settle down and feel at home in, in your heart. And you stand by faith on that. That truth of who God has made you in His Son begins to control your thinking, begins to control your life. And as it does, and you begin to comprehend the value that God has for you and how He's using you to honor and glorify and accomplish His purpose, His eternal purpose. You are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which He before ordained that we should walk in them. Then you begin to be filled with all, controlled by all the good. You want God to control your life today, then you let the love and grace of God to you through the cross work of Calvary control your life. You live your life as who God's made you in His Son. Don't define yourself by your failures. Don't define yourself by religion and tradition and your performance. Define yourself by who God made you in Christ. Walk by faith in the truths of His Word. Take your stand on the Scripture and who God says you are in Christ. And then see the power of His Word, His Spirit. Take His Word and empower your life and have Christ living through you for His glory. We're certainly glad you've joined us today. We always hope this program will be a blessing to you. Tell your friends about the program, would you, and get them listening with you. Until next time, Maranatha. Thank you, Brother Jordan, for that message from the Word of God. Friends, we have a cassette tape we'd like you to have to go along with today's study. The tape is entitled, The Bible's Most Important Prayers. It sure is free of charge. It's our way of saying thanks for listening. We'll be happy to see that you receive your free copy along with a free subscription to our monthly Bible study, The Grace Journal, if you simply write us here at The Message of Grace. The address should be on your screen. That's The Message of Grace, Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. If you prefer, you can also call us during regular business hours at area code 708-529-0520. Request tape offer number 299. That's tape offer number 299. The Message of Grace is a ministry of Grace School of the Bible, and we're glad you've been with us here today. If our study together has been a help to you, we're happy to put you in touch with a Bible study in this area where the message of God's wonderful grace is proclaimed from His rightly divided Word. And friend, if you are still not sure of salvation, that your sins are forgiven, and that you have eternal life as a present possession, let us know. We're happy to send you some gospel literature that will show you the way. That address again is the Message of Grace, Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. Thanks for being with us today, and God's best until we meet next time for another Message of Grace. <laughs>